and there were some who had near-death experiences. Pete Arkenberry was coming down from Beatty. He'd been prospecting in 40 Mile Canyon, and he was headed for the Greenland Ranch. And it was hot. He ran out of water. And the only thing that saved him, he stayed on at Burra. Even though he wasn't all there, he had a hold of the saddle horn, and the brewer took him to water. Burrows, they have a much better sense of smell, and I believe there is something to the fact they probably could smell water, or, or could maybe hear it far better than human beings. The prospector Shorty Harris, very thirsty in the desert, is said to have approached a, a spring at which he saw camels. And he thought, this can't be true. Got to be a delirium or mirage. So he passed it by. And later on, he learned that camels did, in fact, roam the desert in those days, and it was a real spring. People who settled in the desert were often called on to rescue the newcomers and fortune seekers. One of the most well-known was Ralph Jacobus Fairbanks, better known as Dad. Dad Fairbanks was kind of called the guardian angel of the desert, and he had come out here in the late 1800s, and he befriended the Native people out here, where a lot of people were kind of afraid of the Native Americans, but Dad became friends with them, and they took him all over Death Valley. So he knew Death Valley. So whenever somebody was missing, people would go to Dad and ask him to go looking for him, and Dad always obliged, and he would go out and, and look for people, and. Usually he would find somebody. Sometimes he wouldn't find them until it was too late. But he is credited. Now, I don't know if he actually rescued 50 people from Death Valley, but, but that is a, a story that sprung up about him. But he, he certainly did rescue an awful lot of people from Death Valley, and, and a lot of the people that he brought back were still alive when he found them. And he did this clear up until he was an old man. He would still go out and look for people whenever somebody was missing. Oh, that man was something else. I tell you, he was a rough character. So this one time, this old guy, he was down in San Bernardino. He died down there. And he sent, they sent word by wire that he had died and that they were to notify him and would he give him a proper burial. And he wired back that he would. So they sent the ashes on the Greyhound bus, and he went over, and he had a shovel in his hand, and he got the ashes and walked across the road, dug a hole, put the ashes in it, and his daughter said, well, you can't do that, Dad, that's not. He says, I said I'd bury him, and I did, and he just tamped it down and covered it all. <laughs> and that was that. And I mean, he was, oh boy, he was something else. He didn't care much for the frills. This is prospector Jim Hull. Just 16 days after this picture was taken, Dad Fairbanks found his body. He buried him as he did the others in the desert. To be buried in a municipal cemetery in Las Vegas or Los Angeles, to be shipped someplace, their whole thing is bury me where I lived. Bury me in the surroundings that I had to live with every day. I'm part of the desert. I'm a feature of the desert. And this is where my remains should remain until the desert consumes me. Ida Strobridge was a woman who prospected in northeastern Nevada and knew a good many prospectors. And she believed that some of them actually wanted to die in the desert when their time came. Uh, these were men who loved the way of life, the freedom, the independence, the eternal hope of Bonanza, and they were hooked on the desert, too. So Ida has written, At death the body rests where the heart found its joy in life. What lover could ask more? Today, it's the backcountry hiker or tourist who leaves the safety of developed areas and paved roads who might find themselves in danger. In hiking with another partner of mine across the salt bogs and into Trail Canyon here on Death Valley, back in 1989, I saw my partner under moonlight. I saw his lips begin to stick together, and as he talked, it was like spider webs, and it was luminous. 
because it was under a full moon. And he became co incoherent. Uh, fortunately, we did find water up in Trail Canyon. There was a spring up there that we did locate. I kept my partner down, no talking, don't move. I went ahead by myself and I was dodging shadows because of the moon began to play tricks with me until I actually slipped in some mud. I thought it was a shadow. I stepped into it. It was mud and I had found water. The key to desert survival is water and no one knew more about water than Native Americans. Native Americans never underestimated the desert and they knew it very well. If one spring was dry, they knew where the next one was and they had lived all their lives in this harsh environment and they knew how to survive in it. I never have come across any account of a Native American coming to grief in the desert. When it got really hot on the valley floor, they moved up into higher elevations. You know, they didn't stick around in the heat. Uh, they would go up to places like Wild Rose or Grapevine Canyon and spend the summer there. When you look at the Western Shoshone, the Northern Paiute, the Washoe, the Southern Paiute, there are people who had to make do with scarcity. That is what's so compelling versus other tribes in the Pacific Northwest or, or California uh, in the plains is how do we survive with scarcity? They were best prepared over centuries to deal with the desert. It was the newcomers who had to look out on this great American desert, the Great Basin, and say, oh gosh, is this any place I want to be? And if it is, how do I survive in the desert? 